the windows are cracked open. All right. Should, should we close the windows later? No. But there is Edgar. Here, I don't know if it's recording, but uh, I don't know. It's really a mess, this system. It's still... Uh, it's not recording. It's not, re but uh, uh, it's not Zoom that has to record. It's the system. Oh. Because here the light is... Uh, it's been a uh, red spot on the top no. when recording. Yeah, but it's not Zoom that is recording. Yeah. It's that camera. Yeah. But, but did you... Uh, you have been in this lecture room before? No. no, no it's no, first time. First time. Okay, let, let me ask the guy if it's recording me, doesn't it? That was the instructions. <laughs> okay. Um, so, hello, everybody. Uh, I hope I will learn your names in with time. But at the beginning, maybe I will ask, uh, pointing you. <laughs> and now, first question. That's it's I mean, quite important. Do you already have experience with Python? Are you familiar with Python? Very just can you answer one by one? Just. So that I know very little, very little and uh, with other langu uh, programming languages. Uh, no. No. Ah, so you are very new to programming. Okay. Yeah. And did you try to follow the tutorials? Uh, no, um, um, I couldn't follow them. I was uh, I wasn't able to access the Jupyter notebook and uh, okay. uh, I was completely lost. For what I have to do with this files. That's a problem. Uh, but uh, you are other people had problems by okay. So this do you have a laptop uh, by the way? Yeah. Yes. Okay. Maybe it's a good idea if we can uh, connect. But did you try to open the Google Drive folder? Uh, yeah I opened it but I wasn't able to access the because you had to copy the the, the, the I copy them to my Google Drive. Exactly. Do uh, and Google Collab was uh, opening, but I couldn't run it. Because actually today we will uh, just uh, see all the exercises together. So, it, and it's better if you are in front of you. You are the your laptop here. Uh, okay. So okay. But did you try to, to do the tutorial to do the exercises, all of you? Yes. Did you have a problem? No. You were able to complete everything? No. Not yet. Ah, okay. Okay, that's good. Yeah, let's wait a moment. Let, let me ask to the people. Uh, okay. You guys on uh, Zoom, did you follow the... Maybe I should watch that. Did you follow the, the tutorial? Yes, sir. Okay, you were able to open the notebooks and do the exercises? Yes. Unless me. <laughs> okay, a little bit, it's fine. And the other two guys? Yes. Okay. And Jonathan? Yes, uh, you can follow the exercises. Okay, good. good. So let me finish the run. So you don't you have not much experience with Python, you? Uh, I know a little bit of Python. Mm -hmm. I have experience in Java, okay. Ah, okay. Uh, C++, and um, Visual Basic. Okay, so perfect. Okay. Uh, I, I don't have experience in Python. Uh -huh. I only know the, the old for training language. Okay, okay, no problem. You? Um, I have experience in Python, but not in any other. Okay, it's fine. Well, you? Yes, I have experience. Okay, good. And you, Orlando? Do you have experience with Python? You and Zoom? Uh, yes, a little bit. A little bit, okay. And the other two guys? Uh, yeah, a little bit. A little bit, okay. 
So I mean, if you are not so familiar, it's very important that you that you do all the tutorials. It's uh, I mean also because uh, we don't have much time. I mean, we also, even in the, in the lecture of tomorrow, we'll start to solve an exercise together. So it's I mean, it's good that you are online with knowing Python, which is very easy, by the way. But okay. Let Okay, you do a lot of copy, so something like this. For example, the exercises, so you do the copy. Create on your drive, I think. So, I mean, I, it's the most probable programming language that you will encounter in your future, so it's very important that you learn it. It's maybe not the most uh, efficient, like in terms of performances, but there are several advantages in using Python, which is very easy to read, it's very easy to write, uh, it's full of documentation, so if you have a problem, you Google it, you find the solution. It's full of libraries that can do for you whatever you want, I mean, a library for machine learning, a library for simulating systems, whatever. And, uh, I mean, in the, yeah, and if you want to do machine learning, you cannot do machine learning without Python. So it's very a uh, requirement to, to, to know Python. And uh, so uh, there is also a drawback of using Python because it's very slow. It's very slow, and um, but there are two points. I mean, it's slow, but there are two big advantages uh, that can uh, like counter balance the, the slowness. The first one is it's very fast to write. So if, if you have to write a code in Python, it takes half of the time that writing a code in C. Maybe it's twice slower, but I mean, you can compensate. It depends always on what you want to do. And the second uh, important point is that the libraries that you will use in Python are not written in Python, but are written in uh, already compiled code. So they are fast as C. So if you are able not to write directly, for example, a for loop in Python, but to exploit the, the function inside a library, this function will be as fast as C. And we will see an example during the tutorial. So. It's true, it's slow, but all the other advantages, I mean, outperform this, this small disadvantage in a way. Anyway, maybe you will finish to do a thesis uh, using C, I don't know, but uh, it's very probable that you will use Python. <laughs> 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 
whatever, okay. So, um, how much time do I have? Is I lost a quarter of an hour. Uh, today we have until 4, right? No, 4.30. Two hours. Two hours. Okay, so maybe we can have a five, ten minutes break at the, big, at, the, at the middle of the lecture. Okay, today we will be a very boring maybe lecture because I mean, learning a, a programming language is it's boring because it's just about syntax and uh, so it will be boring but it's important that you understand everything. And uh, I think uh, uh, um, the first exercises are quite easy. And unless there are problems, I can go through them very fast. Uh, and uh, what, what is your name, sorry? Uh, site. Site. Yeah. And uh, maybe site, you can try to do them uh, in the next days. And uh, okay. if, you, if you have problems, uh, you can text me. Yeah, I'm familiar with the for loops, while loops. And okay, okay. So here, printing the factors of a number is just a for loop and an if. So it is super easy. Check if a number is prime, it's very easy. Uh, the, just the complication might be for, um, for the range functions. OK, this is typical of Python, and you will learn during the tutorial. But basically, if you want to iterate between uh, a starting number and ending number, you have to use range. So yeah, I each time a different number increasing. Yeah, yeah OK. Uh, I mean, there are different. Uh, you can use range in different ways. If you for, for uh, if you do like this, for example, this will print i from zero to nine if it's able to connect. All right. You can also specify the beginning of the sequence, so for example, three, and you can also specify the step. So every three numbers. Uh, in the for loop, when we say for i in range, uh, what it mean? It mean uh, uh, i is equal to zero. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I'm printing. I mean, at every iteration of this for loop, I'm yeah. printing i. Uh, so uh, this the range remembers that the previous number was zero, and the new number is. Uh, no, no. I mean, the only information that we have during an iteration is i. And i is equal to 3 the first time, to 6 the second and time. How range know that uh, the this time what uh, uh, gives back to us? What do you mean by how? I mean, it's, it's already implemented inside Python. I think Python. in next iteration, range must uh, give back another number. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And it uh, must be an increasing number. And uh, range must know that the previous one was that, and I'm going to give this one one uh, okay. more than the previous one. But yeah, I mean, in, in some somehow yes, he has to know. Actually, I think uh, that range, the way in which Python works, I'm not totally sure because I, I'm not an expert of deep programming. But I think that range is an object which is called iterable, and it's already a sort of list. Mm -hmm. So when you write range. Yeah. The program interprets it exactly okay. as a list that we, we will be go through all the list and printing. Okay, so we have a list, uh, list as at first and uh, four looks at each elements of yeah, the yes. list. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Uh, right. So this is okay. So something very important about Python uh, are lists. I mean, and uh, if you, someone is used to programming C++ or Fortran, this is a huge advantage because it are very easy to use. I mean, for example, in a list you can store different types of uh, variables. Uh, you can play a lot with lists without problems. So, uh, of course, they are m much slower than the usual array, for example, in C++, but are very versatile. This exercise was about list, and I think it was quite easy because, again, it was about, uh, I mean, if you read the tutorial, you will see it. It's about uh, appending an element to a list, for example, uh, if this element satisfies a condition. This is about just indentation. OK. 
Okay, this is quite easy, it's quite straightforward. But anyway, if you had a problem in doing this, this exercise, tell me. Something that I want to show you is um, the following thing. So, to, there was a point here in which I asked you to find the unique, unique elements in a list. And to, 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 to solve this problem, I, um, I suggest you, I mean, in the tutorial it's, it was written to use set. Mm -hmm. So what I want to show you here are the different data structure, structure of Python. Actually, there are four main data structure in Python. The first one is a list. So for example, L equal list. You can write like this. The second one is dictionaries that uh, it's the point of the, the other exercises, we will see later. And then there are two other data structures. The, sec the, the second one is ta ta tuple. I think the pronunciation is tuple. So what is the difference between list and tuples? Is the following one. is that tuples are immutable, it's said. So if you try, for example, if I want to change oops, the, the element 0 of a list, I can do it. Uh, if I Professor? Yes, tell me. We are not able to watch the projected screen. Ah, really? So oh, that's yes, a big problem. Yeah, probably to share a screen. Yeah, to share a screen. Ah, OK, yes. I just have to share a screen. OK, sorry, I didn't realize it. OK, I think now it's yeah, fine. thank you. <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry a lot. OK. So the tuple instead is uh, unmutable, and this seems uh, OK. Why should be like this? Use the list of uh, um, the name of the list and tuple, you don't need to. Yeah, you're, you're right. I don't need to specify this. But I mean, just to show you that this is a list. Actually. Uh, yeah, this is, I mean, this is the proper, it's like you are casting uh, the object inside the parentheses as a list, and here you are casting the object inside the, inside the parentheses as a tuple, but you, there are shortcuts that, I mean, you can also write uh, something like this. Lists are defined with the square brackets and tuples with the round brackets. This is just syntax. But the point of using tuples is that uh, tuples can be used as a key of dictionaries why a list cannot. This is the main difference and the reason why you should use a tuple sometimes. I mean, and the fact that you cannot change a tuple makes it more robust in a way. You are sure that uh, I mean, you inside your code there, there are no, I mean, you, can, you cannot change it, so you are safe and they are safe. Uh, I, th I think also in the tutorial I, I wrote this. And the third element in the third data structure is set. That is the one that uh, it was the point of the exercise. I can also do like this, for example. I can cast uh, the list as a set. And again, set is even less. Uh, I mean, I cannot even uh, accede to the element. I cannot. I cannot index a set because it's not ordered. It's really like a mathematical set. All the elements are unique and there is no order, ordering, while a list is a sequence that is ordered. So in a way, they save a bit of memory, they save a bit of performance, because they don't require the, the information about ordering. But okay, This is quite technical, but in the future, if you encounter this kind of structure, you know what they are and why they are used. Okay, uh, Okay. so uh, the other part of the exercise is quite uh, straightforward, I think. And also the exercise about dictionaries, it was quite easy. Okay, let me see. I just want to, to see, I, I just want to show you another feature of Python that it's used a lot. Okay, let, let's let's uh, go through the exercise a bit. So here you have a stock. So in your shop, for example, you have different fruits with different quantities. 
and the price, so the same fruit as a cost. Uh, this is the way of initiali initializing dictionaries. You have to use these curly brackets. And uh, I mean, uh, maybe you know that uh, the way in which you uh, interrogate a dictionary is the following. The indexes are the string, but actually, as I can told you, you can define dictionaries in which the, the keys are, are other data types, like uh, tuples, like integers, like uh, are more general than st can, strings can be used, but also other, other variables can be used. So this is uh, about dictionaries. and. Uh, the first uh, uh, point was to print out, to, to write a function that prints how many fruits that are in the store and uh, the price of the fruit. Very easy. What I wanted to show you is the solution about this, the third point. That, I mean, I did that all in the, same, in the same function. And the third point was to check if the fruit was inside the dictionary. So here, what I'm doing is printing the info of this fruit check is fruit is in the stock so this this uh, statements statement uh, check if this key is present in this dictionary and it does this instruction otherwise it does this other instruction okay that's fine what i want to show you is an alternative way to do it which is used a lot in python and this, it's try except and uh, let me show you how this works if you try to, okay, you have stock, and you try to, I don't know, know the quantity of cherry, and if you remember here there is no cherry, mm -hmm. this gives you an error. And the error, and in here there are all the information about the error, so this is called key error, that is a, a specific error of dictionaries, and it's saying that uh, the, the word cherry is not present. Okay, a way to manage this error is to do the following. There is this instruction that is called try to do this. So the program tries to ask uh, stock is there cherry inside you? If uh, everything works, nothing, nothing happened. I mean, this instruction is, uh, is done. So for example, this new variable s is written. But if the instruction doesn't work, there is this keyword that is called accept. And here, for example, you specify the error. So this is saying that if a key, if a key error is happening, do something else. So print, uh, I don't know, no. So, in this way, it tries to do this instruction, it sees that there is an error, and therefore it executes this, this, this other instruction. And, uh, okay, it remember these two keywords, uh, and, I mean, in a, lot, in a lot of Python codes, you will find these two keywords. I mean, uh, looking, I mean, in this kind of, kind of simple exercises, in that they don't seem so useful, but in complex programs, uh, they save you a lot of time if you, for example, have parameters that uh, uh, they, they need to be specific variables and you want to control which variables are there, then, I mean, they can be useful in some context. Anyway, well, this, this, uh, this is the solution that you have in the folder of drives, so at the end uh, you will find the same. You will, you will find this code inside your drive folder. And basically, that's it. Uh, all the other parts of the, the exercise is quite straightforward. It's just uh, iteration inside dictionaries. And, uh, okay. Okay, I think we can... I mean, uh, if there are no questions about this last part, this, this exercise, I can move forward. 
Of course, if you have questions later, you can write me an email. But actually, I wanted to move to the other exercise, which was more important for our purposes, which is the exercise about NumPy. Okay. So, did you, did you try also to do this exercise about NumPy? Okay, maybe I'll ask you how did you solve the first point? Don't see the solu my solution. Mm -hmm. the, the first point was... Uh, was to generate uh, a sequence of random numbers between plus one and minus one. Is there someone who wants to tell me how we did? And you can use the range function. Yeah, range, but that range, uh, uh, you have to generate yeah, a random number. Yeah, there is a random function. Yeah, there is a random function. Yeah, there is this. Uh, this I wrote in the tutorial. And int. This random function generates a random integer between, for example, 0 and 2. So how did you do to generate between plus one and minus one? It seems super easy, but there is a, tri a tricky point here. Tell me. Yeah. Um, I use raising this uh, formula. And the you, you, you use that for the, the for loop? Uh, no, I don't think. Yes. So, so the difficulty? No, no, I use this thing, but I make a condition. Since this, this um, okay. same task, allow us to generate a number between minus one and, okay. and plus one. We have zero. Okay, so you change the zero in minus one. No. Huh. If I change it, they, they should not be good. I I count the number, when I generate the, the list, uh -huh. I remove all the zero oh. and generate again the number such a way that I have to Ah, but because you are solving already the next part of the... Because uh, later I will ask, I, I was asking to, to, to count the number of ones. No. Now here the, the, the exercise, the plain exercise was generate a sequence of plus and minus one yeah. randomly. Since when we use this code we have zero. Uh-huh. Yeah. And remove zero. But at, the end, zero. but at the end you have only ones. Ah, but you were, you, ah, okay, you understood. So you did like this. So you generated between minus one and one. one. Yes, after that I remove. Ah, okay. Yeah, I think yeah, it works also like this, but you are, I mean, from a programming point of view, is you are wasting uh, one third of uh, power because you are generating a lot of, I mean, one third more run numbers that you need. I mean, you are generating more numbers and then eliminating this number is not so efficient. Uh, since, if I say, if I need 10, 10 numbers. Yeah. When I generate using this code, mm -hmm. I have five minus one and one. That means I need again five numbers. Yeah, exactly. There is also this problem. Yeah, it's, you see that it's a bit uh, yeah. cumbersome. Then I remove all the zero and generate again. Okay, okay. Such a okay. way that the length should be ten. Okay. Okay. It, I mean, the solution is correct, but it takes. Uh, more computational power if you want. I mean, if you have to generate uh, one billion random numbers, is not the best way to do it, yours. No. Um, Your solution? Yeah, so I simply uh, define the size as 20. It will minus yeah. one, one yeah. 20, that's it. What do you mean like this? Uh, but one, minus one, one, uh -huh. and 20. But this is that it generated between zero and minus one. Yeah, that is a problem. <laughs> I mean, yeah, but it was just because I, I wanted to, to, to show you a, a feature of NumPy. Uh, then I checked your um, solution and I like open. Okay, let me show you my solution. I mean, another, another, you can do, for example, you generate this array, that is a list, 
then you can iterate over the array, and when you find that zero, you switch to minus one. Mm -hmm. And now, if you switch, I think it is not good. What? Since we say, okay, all the zero will be changed, the zero to minus one. I mean, I can do like this no, no, no. in len. That was the but I mean, if you use a four, it's not, it's, it's never a good idea to use four in Python. I mean, this is, this is solving the problem. Why is it not a good idea to use four? I will show you in the same exercise. I think using if would be good. No, I mean, now I'm using if, if uh, the a in position i is equal zero, then no, this keyboard is then a i equal minus one. This I think would solve the exercise, but now for sure doesn't work. No, is one is not working. Uh, um, is minus one to positive plus one. Uh, plus one, uh, I have a question. If you are changing the zeros, so to a specific value of one or minus one, uh -huh. it, it is not uh, random, no? No, but because you first generate the sequence randomly. Okay, let me do it step by step. Yes, but the zero would be like the same number. Yeah, yeah, of course. Uh, I mean, the randomness is inside A. Then, if you find that zero, ah, because I'm using this, you see that this is again, this is a random sequence of plus and minus one. I mean, of course, the position of the zeros and the position of the ones are the same in the two list, but you don't care. I mean, it's you can generate zeros and ones in the uh, random. Yeah. Function, and use the zero to change the one yeah I mean but the same it's the same thing I mean at, at, at the end you have to change the zeros into minus one yeah yeah okay I mean also the point, I mean the, 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 the point of all of this is to show you that I mean the first message is it's always a better idea to use four and I will show you why it's in time in terms of time and to solve with this problem without using four you have to exploit a property of NumPy that is the following. Yeah. Okay, let's generate A. And if you do A plus oops, plus one, what happens? So the a property of arrays is that when you do an operation like this, it acts element wise. So one is added to all the elements of the list. So what you can do, for example, is to multiply by 2, for example. Where is... Oh my god, this keyboard doesn't have... <laughs> okay, now 2. And you do minus 1. No. I ah, know, because I'm generating between... I have to do like 0, 2. Okay, so here you're generating at least between 1 and minus 1 without yes, using four loops. And I can guarantee that this is the fast, fastest solution, and I will show you why in just a second. So remember, the main message is that when, if you can avoid four loops, avoid four loops. If you can use actually NumPy instead of four loops, use NumPy. It's not always possible. Actually, in the problem that we will solve in this course, uh, I mean, and at the beginning we, we, we can, but at the end we will, we, when we will try to solve a complex statistical mechanical problem like Monte, more like a easy model, it will be, you, you, you couldn't, so uh, Python will be a, a bad choice to, to solve this kind of problem, but I mean, uh, um, there is always a... Sci-fi? Sorry? Sci-fi? Ah, okay, you, you can, no, no, but with sci-fi, Maybe there is already a, 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 um, an algorithm to sample the ideas in model, so yes. I mean, it's not a good idea to write your own code, but it's always a good idea to, to, to take the code from a library, yes. And this will be, of course, much faster than the program that you will write, usually. I mean, even maybe you are a genius of programming, but usually 
<laughs> okay, now the, the exercise goes on, and uh, I think this is the most in, most important part of this exercise. So the next question was, you, you have this sequence of plus and minus one, and you want to count the number of ones that there, is in, there are inside. And I proposed uh, uh, three methods of doing this. So the first one is to use this uh, unique. Unique is, a, I mean, uh, you can go on the documentation and see how it works. And you, it, it does like this. So you pass uh, this array, you specify this, uh, this instruction, and it counts the number of ones. So if you launch this function, having a, an argument, the array that we generated before, you realize that there are Okay, I did, okay, didn't generate anything. There are nine ones, okay? You can count, you can check that it's, it should be fine. Second method is to use the for loop that I told you, told you before, avoid to use it. So, I mean, this is easy. Ah, okay, this is another point. In, in, uh, there, is, there, are, there is also this way of iterating elements. So here, before you, we were using range, so you are generating an integer between uh, a minimum and a maximum. Here you are iterating the elements of the array. So you are passing all the elements that you specify. And you check if the element is equal to one, you are increase your counter. So again, the answer should be nine, it is. And then there is this solution, that is, you will see the best one. Uh, what I'm doing here is, uh, I mean, uh, at the beginning, try understanding this solution is not, is not so straightforward. It requires some, some time. What I'm doing here, let's see here slowly. Uh, so we have generated an array. So what happened, this is the array that I generated before. It's uh, the, this one, the usual one. What happens if I do like this? I'm doing array equal equal one. This is the a Boolean operator. So like a summation, like a multiplication, this is working element-wise. So it returns a new array, a new NumPy array, where there is false if the number is one, and it's true if the number is minus one. But then there is also this fact. that the function sum interprets the true like a one and the false like a zero. So if I call sum, I'm just summing the number of true elements that are the number of one elements. So the, this gives the number of true that corresponds to the number of ones. You see, it's a bit convoluted, but in this way, I mean, this is the function for counting the number of ones, and you can write it in one line, like this, without using for loops, and doing everything inside NumPy. And you will see that this is the best solution. Then I have a, a, a final uh, function. Yeah, yeah, uh, it's telling me about the return and how it works. Ah, OK, okay. this is the, the way function works. So uh, you will see in the tutorial, but in two words, what you are doing here is defining uh, this function that has yeah. this name, uh, and returning its meaning that uh, when you call this function, it uh, return as what? It's ah, okay. You, uh, this is the I mean the beauty or the can can be confusing, but you don't have to specify the element. The, the, the type of variable. It can be an integer, it can be a string, it can be a matrix, it can be so the object that you define the class. When we uh, want to return something, it might be, uh, it might return it as a variable for us or as a printing. No, no, as a variable, always as a variable. I mean, unless you, you, you write here print something, but it returns a variable, and that's it. 
and uh, when we receive the uh, uh, what the return is are giving us what uh, this is just the integer number which is the number of ones yeah. it depends uh, on the time is giving the amount of this integer to me mm -hmm. and how can I receive that uh, uh, if you I mean here for example you see I'm defining the function, I'm returning this, and I'm printing all of this, that is an integer. Okay. But I can also do my so int. You directly uh, use the amount that gives you return in a print. Exactly. Yeah, I'm skipping that passage. I mean, here I'm sort of building a, okay. an integer variable. And, yeah. Okay. Yeah, actually, uh, I mean, Python is, is thought in a way that uh, if you, you can write uh, in very few lines. I mean, there are very short, a lot of shortcuts to condense your code in very few lines. I, I don't want to go into details because maybe this is just, uh, just aesthetics, but I mean, yeah. Okay, well, let's come back to the point that was quite important. So here I define these three functions. So if you remember, I have unique using a library. I have for loop and I have numpy. Then I do the following. So the, the other point of the exercise was to compare the performances. So what I'm doing here is to generate a big array. This is like the array before, but with one million uh, elements. Then uh, I use this library, which is just to compute the time. So here, I initialize my, my timer. I generate my result using the unique method of NumPy. And I print the result and the time that it took to generate this result. Then I do the same for the four loops. So I initialize my timer. I store the time. And I print the result and the time that it took. And I do the same for the NumPy summation. Okay, I didn't define this. Okay, so now you can see the result that it's quite, I mean, it's so super impressive. So here you generated uh, one million length uh, sequence. There are uh, five, 500,000 something uh, ones. So the method with unique uh, took uh, 0 0.03 second. The method with the for loop it took 10 time. The method with the uh, Boolean mask, which is using the sum uh, with the true and false sequence, took uh, 10 times less than, I mean, it's the, so the fastest, you can see. And it's one order of magnitude faster. So it's, it's not, it's something. I mean, if you, it, it, it really changes order of magnitude of computational time to use uh, NumPy instead of for loops. And this is what you have to remember. And actually, there is a, a method that it's, it's even faster that I can show you. And again, this one is again a bit uh, convoluted, but uh, it takes half of the time of. Uh, no, actually, no, 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 it's not faster. It's, it's not faster. But I, I want to show you it anyway because it can be interesting. The other method is, uh, I mean, same spirit of the method with sum inside NumPy, but it's using a, a different, uh, a different approach. Okay, what I'm doing here is to do the following. So you you remember, if I do this, this is just uh, the the two false. So I'm storing these two false inside this new array that I call mask. And of course, this mask is the true false. Then what I'm doing is the following. I'm passing the mask as an index. And uh, passing a mask as an index, you can guess what happens. I mean, the mask is the false, true, false, true, and the, le the length is the same of the original array. So what will happen, it will generate an array where there is only the true, I mean, it's selecting only the true elements, right? So basically, if I do like this, I have a vector of ones 
because the two were the ones were. And so I can compute the number of ones by I mean, looking at the length of this array. And I mean, this is another way, a fast way to compute the, the to solve this problem. It's not the fastest, but it's good that you know that you can uh, use this Boolean mask. Uh, and if you, in, in complex programs, uh, if you want to avoid for loops, uh, this is usually the best way to avoid for loops because you are, I don't know, you want to select only two columns of your matrix uh, so you can generate a Boolean mask with two columns, I don't know, whatever. All right. And I think here we saw everything. Okay, maybe we can take a break now because now I'm starting the second part of the exercise. Sort of 10 minutes break. Maybe you can pause here. Ah, okay, I think now it's okay, now it's good. Cool. I have to wait 10 seconds. Guys on Zoom, are you there? Yes. Okay, good. Okay, but now I, I think I'm writing something on the blackboard, so uh, I should stop share the screen. Because like here now you can see the blackboard, right? Let me check if uh, I can see an idea. Yeah. Okay, so what I'm going to do now is to correct uh, the other part of the, the problem, which is quite uh, long and uh, and maybe it's 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 quite it, it goes in the direction of what we are going to do in this class because it will about uh, study a, a stochastic process. So it's really a, a, a very easy introduction on what, on what is a stochastic process or. It's, it's quite, it's almost stupid, but it's a stochastic process. So uh, the first part of the exercise now I write on the blackboard is to generate uh, what, uh, what is called a stochastic trajectory. So what we are going to, what I asked you was the following. So you have this, this list of plus and minus one. What I asked you was, and call this list, for example, x. Is to define a function, which I define as the fraction of ones inside this list. And as a fraction one of ones, of course, is uh, the number of ones, so let's write like this divided by the length of the list, let's call the length of the list, uh, I don't know, and uh, small n. Super simple. So the first part of the exercise was to generate a list that was growing with n, and for each n to compute this f. So basically, what you were supposed to do was something like this. So you have an iteration over n that becomes n, 1, 2, 3, and so on. Then you build a list uh, I call x. So at the beginning you generate just one number, and this is plus 1, for example. Then you add a second number, which is plus 1. Then you get uh, minus 1, for example. Then Okay, and then for each of these lists you compute f of x, which in this case the fraction of one is one over one. Here is one over two, and here is one over three. Um, of one is right, not minus one. I don't remember. There was one one. It's the same. The fraction of plus one generated. Yes. So in this case it should be zero. No, sorry, this is, uh, yeah. Oh, okay. Now, and, uh, be, uh, be careful that 
and it doesn't change much, but maybe yes. Uh, the list, uh, it doesn't change. It's the same as the one before. So you take this list and you add one element. You take this list and you add one other element and so on and so forth. Okay. So this is the function that you have to compute. And what you realize, of course, is that you try, uh, now I can share the screen. And then the specific solution, you can see the solution, how I uploaded it. But what, I, what you get is something like this, what you should get. So you do this one time and you get a trajectory, you do this the second time and you get a different trajectory. So basically, you are paying a stochastic object. Every, every realization is different from the previous one. Right? But what you know is that, I mean, if the size of the, the list is going to infinity, which is the fraction of one that you expect to be, I mean, how, how many ones you expect, how many fraction of ones you expect if n goes to infinity? Half, okay. I mean, the, this, not, this fraction should, should converge to the probability of generating a one. This is what is called law of large numbers. I mean, all this concept, I, you, you, you will see it with mathematics, but it's good that you... I mean, the more you see, um, the better is. So this is one, it is also called for the one realization of your process. And in general, as I, I told you, every time you repeat the process, you get a different trajectory. So this was the first part of the exercise. Second part, I mean, do, uh, do you want uh, that I go through the solution or? Uh, I mean, the solution is not so hard. Did you try to do it, by the way? Someone did. So you, you managed to, to plot something like this or something? Uh, so I never used math.pk. So ah, okay. It's really difficult. I've used NumPy, but not math. No, okay, okay. You were not, uh, okay. There is a, pa a part of the tutorial about math.pk, yes, yes. okay. I'm, yeah. I'm doing that now. Okay. But, and, but I mean, uh, uh, it was something like, I mean, you, you, you did this, this, this yes. kind of stuff, okay. I mean, the solution is nothing hard, it's just, uh, I mean, what I did here, I can show you briefly, is to generate, uh, this was the function that I wrote before to generate a sequence of plus and minus one, so I generate a sequence. Then I keep the counts of ones instead of the fraction, but just because it's simpler. Then I iterate over all the elements of my sequence, and I append the counts at the last position, okay, by the way, if I, if I have a list and I index as minus one, this is meaning the last position of the vector. And if I find that the element is one, is one I increase the count. I mean, it, it's, it's really, instead of having f here, there I have the number of ones. And what I do at the end is to do this, which seems a bit, um, it's not super intuitive, but basically this is this instruction. Again, here I'm exploiting the fact that NumPy always uh, operates element-wise. So there, here, I'm doing a division between two NumPy's array. So I'm doing a division between the array which has the counts of ones. For example, here I have one, 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 yeah, anyway. And I'm dividing by a vector which is 1, 2, 3, which is the size at each time. So basically, if I do this division, I get the fraction of 1s because I'm dividing the count of 1 by the size at that time. There. Do you agree with me? You are the size. I, I divide, I mean, there in the, in the solution I'm dividing two, these two vectors yeah. and the way in which NumPy works is that uh, 
the resulting vector, let's do like this, which is the resulting vector is a vector which at each element does the division. So here I have one, here I have one also, here I have one third. And here I'm getting my F, basically. I okay. mean, you can do in other ways, but this is just an example. OK, so far so good. So uh, for example, here what I plotted is also the line that you expect uh, uh, to. What if uh, the size of the array would be different? Uh, it's the size is the length. So at first it uh, is this n. No, I mean uh, in dividing the two arrays. Of course, of course, the size sh uh, should be the same. I, I actually don't know. You can try. But I, I don't know if it gives an error or it returns an array which the size of the minimum of the minimum size of the two. I'm, I'm not totally sure of the, about this. You can try. But uh, remember that you can do this if those two objects are numpy arrays. If they are normal list, you cannot do this. And as a suggestion, I mean, it's, it's, it's an hour that I'm repeating this. Use always numpy arrays because they are faster. OK, now let's go on with the exercise. Um, so the second part of the exercise was to generate several of these trajectories. So I can call one of these trajectories a one realization. I, want, I ask you to generate a lot of these trajectories. And what, I, what happens, for example, is this. So here I'm generating uh, 500 trajectories. And I get this sort of. Uh, I mean, you can see that. Can you see it? Yes. I mean, here there are some tricks to do a nice plot, but I mean, you can see from you. The, for example, you can uh, draw these lines uh, with some, some transparency so that you get this effect of uh, where the, 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 colo the color is more intense. It's meaning that there are more trajectories. It's done with this alpha. You can go through the solution. It's, I think, quite easy. But what you can notice from this plot is that, I mean, even though each time you get a different trajectory, there are some sort of regularities in what's happening. So all the point of stochastic processes is to deal with these random uh, processes, with this random uh, system, and you give up to understand uh, what is the next, the, 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 the exact outcome of the next event. You want to understand what is statistically the outcome of the next event. So you, you give up on understanding, oh, my next trajectory will be exactly this line. But you can understand my next trajectory will have this average, will be spread around this average, uh, having some standard deviation. So you are studying your object in a statistical way, not in a deterministic way. And this is all the point of statistical mechanics and. Uh, and uh, stochastic processes. So let's try to do this in this exercise, which is simple, but it's a stochastic process. So the two objects that we want to study is, as I told you, the average and the standard deviation. So let's compute this. So maybe I can write on the blackboard uh, uh, the solution, because here it's quite, uh, it becomes quite uh, long. The solution, okay, if I stop share. So let's uh, uh, do the same uh, things. So for example, maybe here, I mean, I, my solution was the following. Instead of, n, it was of having n going from 1 to n increasing at one step, 
one unit, one unit each step, but I can choose uh, a list of ends so it, it goes faster. So here I have n, uh, a list of n, for example, so I have n1, n2, n3. So for example, this is 10, uh, this is 100, this is something else. So I iterate over this. At each iteration, what I do? I generate a sequence of sequences. So I generate a lot of axes. R times. So I uh, here in this line, for example, I fix the end, I generate uh, uh, sequences of size 3. And so you will have, uh, I mean, I cannot write everything. It will be x1, xn1, x1, xn1, r times. So what is different from one line to the other is the size of the sequences. Then what you want to compute is the average, for example, and the standard deviation. So here, from each sequence, you can get the f of each sequence. So we, you will have a list of the your f's. So you will have the f1, f2, fr. So the fraction of 1 in each list of size n1. And then you compute the average. So you have the average of f. And you have the standard deviation of f. So are you familiar with this notation? You know what's that meaning? Average and standard deviation. And again. Of course, this average will be a function of this n1. And this standard deviation, let's call it uh, sigma f, sigma f, f, n1, f of n2, sigma f of n2. So it, it's clear, I mean, the, the, the global idea. Because I, I have two iterations on the way. I have the first iteration of the sizes, and then I have another iteration over all the trajectories that I'm re realizing with that size. So question for you, uh, what do you expect the average is? for each size. So you have to imagine, it's, you can imagine also for this simple example of two. You are generating a lot of sequences, sequences of length two, two mm -hmm. in which we find uh, two ones, in another zero ones, in another one ones, and you are averaging among them. So what do you expect to be the average? One half. One half. One half. It's only one half, and also the fact that you can see from this plot, right? Mm -hmm. Because all the trajectory will stay around one half. Mm -hmm. One will be a, more, a bit more up, the other will be a bit more down, but well, the standard deviation is not so trivial. Mm -hmm. So you know, you know what's the meaning of standard deviation in statistics. I hope that it. So basically, it's also saying that the width uh, over which your, 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 your ensemble of trajectory spread so it's giving you an idea of how I'm converging towards the, 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 the 0 0.5 at infinite. And uh, I mean, you will learn how to compute also this standard deviation analytically. Yes, also for this process, you can do it analytically. It's easy. But I, I, I can show you the solution. Uh, we will come back to the histograms later. Uh, let me show the screen.
Yeah. 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 Yeah
this point, I think the number five, but okay, now it's not so important. That, that was asking to compute the histograms of the value. What, what, does, what do I mean to compute the histogram? Let me stop sharing the screen. So here, uh, actually super simple. Here basically I am fixing n. So let's call this n. And again, I'm generating a lot of axes of size uh, n. Let's do like this. Oh, maybe you're confused. There. So from these sequences, you compute the f. Each sequence, you get the fraction of ones of each sequence, and then you compute the histograms, histogram of these numbers. So, do we, uh, I mean, do we, do we, are you familiar with the concept of probability distribution? I hope so. So, if you compute the, uh, where should I should share this. If you copy the histogram, you get something like this. So like you can see that your trajectories are around 0.5. They have a certain width. It's, it's a standard deviation at this size. So basically, it's just like you are, you are cutting this plot in this slice. For example, you are fixing an N. You are stopping all the trajectories here. You are counting all the outcomes at this end, and you are plotting uh, Nice histogram. And basically, I mean, if you if the, the number of trajectories goes to infinity and the, the beans of the histogram become infinitesimal, you get the probability distribution. That, uh, I mean, in this case is called a binomial distribution. You will learn, uh, maybe you already know that what is a binomial distribution, but in the limit, this will be a Gaussian distribution. You will learn everything. And OK, just one, uh, one technical point. If you want to uh, plot probability distributions, first, if you want to plot histograms, the instruction is super easy. So it's uh, matplotlib hist. And you get the histogram. You, you pass as an argument all your f's. So we have the list of f's. And it automatically generates your histograms. But it, this is still not the probability distribution because those are the counts. So you know that the probability distribution should be normalized. So if I integrate below this curve, the, the, the integral should be 1. And to do this in NumPy, you have to specify density equal to. And this in NumPy, if you do histogram with these arguments, you get the probability distribution that is plotted in a way that the area, the area under the curve is integrated and it's it, the, the integral is 1. Okay, uh, very well. I think uh, yeah, the exercise was like this. Again, I mean, there are technicalities, but uh, it's important that you understood all the concept of an ensemble of average of standard deviation and stuff like this. And the last point was just to plot, uh, I mean, again, just to see that uh, if I, I can choose to plot different histograms at different ends, and at the beginning the, the histogram is more spread, then it starts to become more picked around the average. And you can expect that at infinity this becomes a delta function with only one outcome. Okay. Good questions? Question from the online people? No? 
Share my screen. Okay, we have a lot of time. I can start to maybe introduce what we are going to do in the next lectures, just to give you a plan of. I mean, from now on, the the, the lectures will be I mean, the structure will be more or less always the same. So maybe I will spend uh, the first half an hour to do some theory at the blackboard. And the rest of the lecture, uh, you will try to solve the exercise that I'm giving you. And uh, I mean, I'm passing, uh, and also people on Zoom can ask me. I can I can answer from from here. Okay. So I will. Do you know that um, as Antonio Celani told you? The point of everything will be try to simulate uh, stochastic processes and statistical mechanics systems with what is called the Monte Carlo methods. No, they cannot see. Okay, maybe it's a good day. Right? Yes. Uh, okay, what are the kind of methods? As you can guess, are numerical methods. It's a huge class of algorithms. Actually, in our course, we will see just the basics, few, few, few examples. But it's very huge. It's used a lot in uh, statistical physics, optimization theory, and so on. And what they have in common is that they solve the problem by generating a lot of random samples. So everything is based on generation of random numbers. And what is curious, what is interesting sometimes is that maybe your problem is deterministic, but uh, it's much more efficient to solve the problem using noise instead of deterministic solution. I mean, maybe this, this can seem quite abstract now, but we will see, I think, something about this. Uh, so, uh, let me just uh, tell you what are the main areas in which you can apply Monte Carlo methods. Maybe the first big area is about uh, computation of areas, volumes, integrals. Maybe your integrals is too complex to be solved analytically by hand. And there are very clever methods based on generation of random samples to solve integrals. We will see a couple of examples in these directions. Then a second point is simulation of stochastic processes. Sorry for my for my writings. It's not so stochastic processes and uh, stack mech system. And uh, I mean, uh, basically, all the exercises that we will do will cover these two big topics. The third one, which is quite important, is used a lot by physicists. Uh, so maybe you will encounter in the future, but we won't see an example in this direction, is uh, optimization of 
for a high dimensional function. Just for your knowledge, I mean, I mean a very famous algorithm maybe you will encounter in your future is simulated anemia. Simulated anemia. No, just for you. No. I mean, last last year we also gave you uh, a, a problem in, of this with this algorithm, but this year we changed the idea. I mean, we changed a bit the program. <laughs> yeah, I mean, okay. So I, again, those are very important, uh, and what I find really interesting about this problem is that. Uh, you are really solving the problems with the brute force. I mean, if, if maybe I'm, I'm stating uh, an exercise, I will tell you, okay, you can solve this exercise in this way. And it seems very stupid. I mean, it's very brute force. It requires a lot of computational power, but at the end, it, it worked very well. And this happens because uh, we will see some, st some mathematical properties of these Monte Carlo methods that are very nice, that are that allows all the algorithms to converge fast and to uh, good result in most of the cases. So maybe I can, I can state which are the, the exercises that we will try to solve. There are five main exercises. First one, maybe you don't know, but uh, you, you know the value of pi, but we will try, yeah, we will try to understand, to, to, to estimate the value of pi. And we will do it by, by, by like uh, throwing stones in a circle. This is really what we are going to do. The exercise of tomorrow. Yeah, maybe, I mean, the application of this kind of exercise is not so great, but here, this is like the DL world exercise for Monte Carlo. I mean, a lot of courses have this exercise as first as first one in, in among all the others. The second one is solving a Gaussian integral. So the first example of numerical integration. Third one is a is a, again similar to the one that I showed you about uh, the, the random sequences. It's about coin tossing game. But we will see more in detail here what does that mean to, to sample probability distribution. We will go more in deep on all the probability theory behind the, the, the sequence of plus and minus one, which are basically coin tossing, because coin tossing is zero and one randomly. Okay, this, uh, then we will move to statistical mechanics, and we will see the two-level system. I think Roman uh, gave you the, the, this, this as an exercise. So I actually think I will uh, solve it again because I think it's solved only in the micro microcanonical and some. I mean, we will see it again th theoretically so we can cover again all the, the elements of stat method. Okay. Again, the more you see this, this concept, the better it is. So we will solve it this uh, analytically and then we will simulate this with Monte Carlo and we will check the solution. And the final one, which is basically, mm, maybe it's the only very interesting problem that, I mean, very not trivial problem to solve. I mean, all these kind of problems maybe can be solved without Monte Carlo. This problem maybe, and I think really, you can, you can approach it only with Monte Carlo and is the simulation of the easing model.
I mean, there are analytical results about teasing. I, I don't know if Jean Barbier showed you something. But I mean, as soon as you increase the complexity, for example, you have three dimensions of the interactions are not so, maybe not, not the main field, okay? You, you cannot solve it. And the only way to study this kind of system is by simulating it. And you will see it's not so easy to simulate this kind of system. And uh, it will require, actually here it will require a theoretical lecture which is about Markov chain. which is a, a big uh, theoretical framework in stochastic uh, physics. And again, this we, you will see it with Edgar, I think, uh, next week. Uh, but we, uh, we will introduce some concept that we need to, to define an algorithm in the Monte Carlo way to solve an easing model. So basically, this is the plan. And, uh, okay. So remember to bring your laptop. Uh, tomorrow we'll start, uh, what time is it? There is still a quarter of hour, but maybe we can finish here for today. I think, yes? Uh, so actually, I don't have a laptop. Ah, you don't have a laptop? Yeah. But, I mean, they were not supposed to, to buy you a laptop? Uh, yeah. So, the policy is under review. We can ask Dr. Chilani to do it. But you, okay, the point is that you still don't have a laptop. Yeah. Yes. Okay, I can bring you mine. I can, I can borrow you mine. Uh, but you can you cannot even work at home, or you can work. Uh, no, we have a laptop. We have a yeah. PC in our room. Ah, okay. No, okay. But you so you can uh, use your drive account here, and you can yeah you can follow from my laptop because I don't need it. But I discovered that I I have to use the desktop. Okay. Uh, excuse me. Could you drive like that? Find the codes just. Uh, no, you yeah, okay because this is the exercise here and you are supposed to solve it. Then, then there is the, the solution, I mean, there is a okay. in which you find the uh, thing solved. Uh -huh. There are other parts. There yeah, yeah, yeah. We're going to uh, this folder. Actually, the part of the is only zero. So the tutorial, uh, there is from one to four, it's the theory, then you have five, which is access and solution. Uh -huh. Then you have six and seven, and five and six and seven. Uh -huh. Okay. Thank you. Uh, not a thing, uh, we haven't asked about the object No, uh, we want, uh, I mean, I don't think about the object or programming, but uh, that's uh, uh, I want you to... Yeah, you mean. <laughs> Java, Java programming is obviously. Yeah, but also Python, I mean. Uh, object orienting uh, is very useful for uh, most of the advanced. No, you're right. I mean, as soon as your program become, uh, becomes large, it's, I mean, doing it object oriented, it's better because it's more readable, it's easier to find the errors, it's more general, generalizable. It's, and in terms of performances, Maybe it's a bit worse than doing everything in but I mean the advantage is on the on this other side, so readability, per, um, finding errors, debugging and the other view that we job. And the difference between classes and functions. Ah, uh, yeah, I mean, if there is a, I mean, a, 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 a class, uh, which is your, your object, mm -hmm. as a word inside. I mean, there are variables, and there are several different functions that, that you can call, I mean, uh, for the, the, the usual example is uh, the class uh, circle. I, I know, about the philosophy of what is object, what is... And no, I don't say, okay, okay. I can, I can agree that, I mean, what is very powerful about objects is, is the heritability of, of objects. So this helps you to write less code because... We, we can have functions. No, yeah, but I mean, you can, uh, for example, uh, you have uh, the class, um, 
polygons with four uh, sides. Mm -hmm. So inside this class, uh, you have the function to compute the perimeter, which is the, the same for all the polygons, because it, it doesn't need, I mean, you just require to know the, the, the length of the sides. And then from this, you can inherit a, I don't know, rectangle. And yeah. here you have the specific yeah. formula for the area, yeah. but you don't have to write again the formula for the perimeter because it's already inside that. But uh, inside, uh, for example, the C program, mm -hmm. uh, you can also define a function and um, have variable on it, or you have a separate uh, file. You mean you, uh, you can define uh, pointers to function that you have? Yeah, and the, usually people say that uh, C is not uh, able to be object oriented but I think we can define the objects and classes everything in form of function in C and then how, how can you define like this 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 heritability between between functions for example we have functions there we define a function we use variable uh, and if uh, our function uh, be a big one, we can separate it in a, another file and call it uh, in our program. In okay, our I, I, okay, okay. I, I, maybe I can see your point, but I mean, there is also a big advantage in, in readability, and it's, it's it more logical. I mean, eh? it works the same. I no, okay, okay. On this point, you're, you're right. you, you, you are right. It works the same. You can write uh, an equivalent code. Uh, object-oriented or uh, sequential or whatever you can call it. But the other, I mean, for sure the, the object-oriented code is much more well-organized in terms of readability. Uh, uh, yeah, I see. But uh, in, in, uh, you pointed out at the sequential of C, but it's not that sequential. You yeah, write the function separately and you call it uh, within your... No, okay, program. okay, okay. okay. Yeah, but it's still not the same as classes. You cannot inherit functions. Uh, yeah, I don't know about. But did you study object-oriented programming? Uh, I, I studied some, but I became really confused about. No, I mean, I, I agree that at first sight it can be a bit confusing. I mean, it seems uh, a lot of new material that you are introducing, but doesn't you don't need this material to solve okay. problems. But as soon as you, you, you start working with object orienting, uh, it's really much better in terms of logic, I mean, in terms of uh, aesthetic, I would say, not in terms of performances, yeah. which is important at the end. If, if your prog program is huge, you, you can lose yourself in all the functions yeah. that you define. Well, if you, you have, if you have a good object oriented programming, everything is a, in a in a module that it's well uh, defined and separated from the others, so you are really a, a, a map between all your modules. Yeah. I mean, you, we can have this discussion as soon as we learn uh, uh, object-oriented yeah. programming. Yeah. <laughs> okay, guys from Zoom, I. I think I can. Uh, do you have a question, by the way? Maybe. Okay, so we can. We see tomorrow. I think from tomorrow we will have. Uh, the lecture is at. Uh, I don't remember. At 4. Because they changed the. the actually, they want. Uh, that the slots are between 2 and uh, 4 and 3.30 and between yeah, 4 and 4 and a half. Four and a half. Four. Yeah. Uh, are you sure? No, okay, in the calendar it's written 4.30, but I think it will be from 4. Because it's, yeah. Let me see. Mm, now it's from 4.30. Four four because there's a class at 2.30 as well. Okay, no, because uh, be before coming here today, uh, Guys from the technical uh, part say that it's better if there are slots of one hour and a half. Okay. From 2 to 3.30 and from 4 to 5.30. And now I really don't know what you are going to do because someone is... Uh, I mean, uh, check the calendar tomorrow morning. Okay. And yeah, be, be ready to be here at 2 or at 2.30. Uh, but I don't, now I don't know what will happen. Uh, 
it's just a matter of organization with the technical people. And I'm still recording, yes. <laughs>